we had a heat wave in Canberra right before I came here, so it's uh, pleasant. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so the title of uh, uh, title of the this mini course, uh, there's going to be four lectures in this mini course, um, is braids and stability conditions. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm hoping to accomplish in the talks. Um, but today's talk will basically not say anything about braids or stability conditions. Um, but I will try to tell you a little bit where, uh, where we're headed. So um, uh, the, I think the point to keep in mind here is that this, uh, this, the workshop is about categorification and quantum topology, maybe also in representation theory. Um, and so I, uh, I'm of the opinion that one of the, one of the places where there should be more interaction than there currently is in mathematics is between the categorification community and the kind of group theory community, geometric group theory, people who think about mapping class groups, things like this. Of course, quantum topology is one of the places where these groups already interact. Um, but there's a lot to do at the interface of, uh, of group theory and, uh, and categorification. And break groups are some nice motivating examples to think about when one uh, dreams about what sort of what sort of theorems one might be able to prove in general about groups um, using categorical techniques. So um, more, I think more important than any of the specific things I'm going to say, the actual mathematics, philosophically, I think that uh, what I would like to try to do is uh, point out some areas where I think there's work to be done at the interface of, kind of more traditional group theory and, um, and categorification. OK, so to that end, uh, if we're going to try to prove something about groups, let's talk about some groups. So, the groups, um, the groups I'm going to talk about this week are, well, today, basically, we're going to talk about uh, file groups so, of, um, of symmetric Katsumudi the algebras. So I will find this in a second. This is one class of groups, uh, which we'll talk about today a little bit. Um, the motivation here, I think, is, uh, is that these guys, what it, I'll define them in a second, but these guys are, are fairly well understood. There's a rich theory of algebraic combinatorics uh, associated to these groups. Um, the geometry that's well known. Many, many basic questions, group theoretic questions one might ask about these groups have, have answers and have pretty answers. Um, <coughs> associated to these groups is uh, another class of groups, which are really the ones that we're interested in. Um, to each of these groups is an associated braid group, maybe sometimes also called an Artin group. Or maybe better, so, I mean, Artin Teats group. So. Um, these groups are not hard to define, but uh, in contrast to the situation for vial groups, these are not well understood at all. Except in special cases. Um, the motivating example of, of a vial group, perhaps, is the symmetric group. In that case, the associated braid group is the Artin N-strand braid group. Um, a lot is known about the Artin N-strand braid group. Not everything is known about the Artin N-strand braid group, but, mu but much is known. But in this generality, um, basically nothing is known about these groups. Any basic question you ask about these groups, uh, it's known whether or not they're finite. But other than that, there's basically um, nothing known about them. And um, that situation hopefully will change soon. And I think that uh, much of the I think one approach to studying, to thinking about these groups is uh, to use tools from categorification and uh, and to some degree, the goal of the workshop will be to try to introduce some of the basic tools that should be relevant. For this. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's get to some definitions. Okay. So let's um, let's fix as a finite set, and then let's. So how are we going to define uh, the vowel group? I'm going to define it. As a as a Cochetter group, in other words, I'm going to give you a specific presentation of the group. So I'm going to take a generator, 
uh, you all call it R sub S. Um, one generator for each element of my finite set. And what are the relations? Well, the, uh, the generators are their own inverses. And um, now if I take two distinct generators, RS and RT, then either they braid or they commute. So um, what, this, is, this is an example of a Coxeter presentation of a Coxeter group. Much of what we'll say this week could be said for arbitrary Coxeter groups, but not everything. So just for simplicity, I'm going to case. So for each, so the relations are for each pair of generators, I just tell you whether they braid or can. Um, so once you've said that, then, uh, then this is a group. So this example. Let's say that just the motivating symmetric group example. If S is one through N, and um, so then adjacent guys braid. And uh, and far apart guys So if these were the relations we chose, in other words, if you have a R2 and R3 braid, but R2 and R4 commute, then the associated double S is just the symmetric group on n plus 1 letters, where the generator Ri is the transposition of I of I and I plus 1 of the symmetric group. So this is the sort of basic motivating example. This is, of course, a f this, in this example, this is a finite group. Um, in general, these groups aren't always finite. I mean, the, <coughs> the finite ones are an example of an ADE classification. Um, but I'll say more about that later. Uh, and just uh, since we're going to get to it eventually, so the braid group associated to this group, one, one reason it's nice to introduce this presentation of the group right away is that that makes it easy to define the braid group. The braid group has the, uh, has the, has the group presentation given by just erasing this first one. So, This is the, the break group. You just erase this relation. Now that's not a very um, that's not a very conceptual way to define a group. Um, so, but in fact, this is a, a fairly natural definition. So, um, so this is just going to give you a little bit more detail about where this lecture series is headed. So, if you so to, so I wanted, so the, it, there's, there's basically two more conceptual approaches, ways to go from the, um, the Lyle group to the braid group. One is to, well, to note that to understand W, and I'll say this in a lot more detail in a moment, the way you basically understand W is you study it as a reflection group. So you, in other words, you study it by by thinking about it acting linearly on a real, a finite dimensional real vector space. So where the generators, the generators act by reflections and hyperplanes in this space. So I'll define this in a moment. But uh, this is the basic tool one uses to study W. Um, now, to go from here to the braid group, traditionally, the way you read uh, group theory literature, the way you get to the braid group is um, is something like a is something like a complexification of the story. Okay, I'll put that in, in quotes. 
So this will go in quotes as well. So what you basically do is, so this was, a, a, say, a real vector space on which this uh, group was acting linearly. And well, so we, we, um, we complexify it. And then, and then you remove, you remove some hyperplanes from this space. Again, I will say exactly what this means in a moment. Now, if you had a real vector space and you remove some hyperplanes, what you'd be left with would not be connected anymore. But if you if you complexify the situation, then this is connected, and the fundamental group of this complexified hyperplane complement is what the the break group is. Morally, For, in, in, actually, this is this is correct when uh, this is the this is there's no quotes needed here. Once I tell you what the hyperplanes are, when W is a finite group, when W is not a finite group, this isn't quite right. But I'll uh, um, I'll replace it with the precise definition in a bit. But morally, the, 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 for the moment, just keep in mind, you start with an action of W on a real vector space. To get the braid group, you complexify the vector space and you remove a bunch of hyperplanes and you look at pi one of that space. So, so okay, if you want to study, so from this point of view, if you want to study, um, so if you want to study the braid group, let me let me call this space whatever it is X W. Then what you really should look at is you should look at the uh, the universal cover of this space, which has an action of the break group on it. So, whatever you do here to understand uh, vial groups, you might want to to study break groups. You might want to study the break group acting on this space. Um, the problem is that. We started with a linear world where there were tools of linear algebra available, and now we have exited the linear world. So the, the difficulty that gets introduced here is, I mean, this is not a vector space anymore, and this is not a linear action of the break group on any kind of vector space. So OK, there's maybe a lot you'd like to, uh, like to understand here, but you've left the world of representation theory in order to do it. Um, and this is, uh, and, and if you are learning about these groups from uh, topologists, this is sort of the, the picture that, will, that always gets presented. But there's another way to move from here to a break, from bio groups to break groups, which is, of course, well known in the categorification community. And that's to, instead of kind of complexifying and doing topology, you can categorify this thing. So another approach. Another approach is uh, is to categorify this story. Um, and again, uh, the topic of tomorrow's lecture will be the specific example of the categorification of this that I want to study. But uh, what that means is that instead of having a group acting on a um, on a finite dimensional vector space, we're going to we're going to consider a group acting on a triangulated category. And uh, it's in such a way that if you pass to the growth and group, you recover this story. So there is some sort of triangulated category. And uh, which decategorifies to this vector space. And the braid group, and the, the action of the vial group here, the linear action of the vial group here, gets lifted to a linear action of the break group on this triangular category. So, um, so there's a bit of a price to pay. We have left the kind of uh, familiar world of finite dimensional vector spaces and uh, undergraduate linear algebra and um, had to embrace some homological algebra. But uh, once one accept that, uh, that price, then we get to move from a linear action of W to a linear action of the break group. And uh, so this is the sort of thing that, you know, those of us who think about not homologies and the like, we, this is the kind of picture we like. It's not a picture that traditional uh, people in geometric group theory think about or, um, uh, or, or know very much about. 
uh, one, I think one of the things that's one of the things that's important for our community broadly to do is to start proving theorems about groups using uh, using these sort of actions. So, so there's a. Well, I'm going to put this in quotes because. So, so in uh, so these are two different ways to start from uh, the Weyl group action on a finite dimensional vector space and produce a braid group action on something. Here you get something nonlinear, um, but which is familiar to topologists. And here you have to use some homological algebra, but you still get something linear. So the, uh, of course, and this is perhaps uh, unsurprising uh, given that uh, we're talking about it in this workshop, but of course, these two pictures are very, very closely related to each other. So these two ways to go from the, the vial group to the braid group, one by taking complexified hyperplane complements and doing topology, and the other by categorifying and doing homological algebra, are, uh, are basically two facets of the same, uh, of the same picture. So the main goal of the uh, lectures this week is to get to the point where we can uh, explain the precise relationship between, um, between these two pictures. And the, uh, and the sort of required language that one needs in order to say it is uh, a stability condition. But, um, okay, but we'll get there. Uh, so this is, uh, this is sort of where we're headed. So the, so, um, so the rough outline. So, uh, sort of today is, uh, then tomorrow we'll talk about the braid group action on the triangulated category T. And uh, third lecture we'll talk a little bit about con stability conditions on T. And the, uh, the last lecture will be something about the relationship between uh, two actions of the braid group. One of them being this action here, the braid group acting as deck transformations on the universal cover of some complexified hyperplane complement. And the, uh, the second being this linear action of the braid group. Okay. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the optimistic goal. Okay. Uh, questions or comments before we? Yep. Why don't you repeat the question and then I'll repeat it. Yeah, I mean, I, the, uh, what I will explain is how to start from this, which is a, tri this is a triangulated category with a linear action of the Bray group, and produce this which is, and produce this projection map, which is this, is, this is some sort of simply connected complex manifold um, with a, an action of break group by deck transfer. Oh, n n um, no, I mean, if you just give me uh, uh, the universal cover of some space with an action of pi 1, there's no formal way, at least not that I know of, to produce a triangulated category with a linear action. Uh, um, maybe a, a slightly different, but perhaps philosophically related question one could ask is, if you have um, uh, if you have a space and you have its mapping class and you have its mapping class group, so the mapping class group um, of a of a smooth manifold acts on the manifold itself. That's a highly nonlinear thing. 
And you could ask, can you produce from that some sort of linear action of the mapping class group on something? And there, yeah, I mean, this is the, uh, this is what um, uh, Fukaya floor theory often does. So you have a symplectic manifold maybe with a symplectic mapping class group action, and you construct a triangulated category, a category, and that is a linear action with the mapping class group. So, um, yeah, this is not, uh, I mean, this story is sort of, is somewhat special to the braid groups, art groups. Oh, why should it be triangulated? Uh, no, that, um, that's kind of forced on you. I mean, if you wanted to, well, I'll say something about that. I mean, this, this uh, um, hopefully you like triangulated categories. If you don't, um, you're, this is the, tri the fact that you have triangulated categories here is essentially unavoidable once you want to study group action. Um, abelian categories typically don't have interesting group actions. Though. Anyway, I'll say maybe a bit more about that. Okay. Uh, other, other questions? Uh -huh. the, the hyperplanes? Um, he, here, so they're real co-dimension too. Okay. So um, let's let's start. So so um, so so we fixed here. We've uh, we fixed our finite set S and the and the group W, which is. Um, okay, so let's uh, let L be the uh, the root lattice of W. So what is L? L is going to be a free abelian group. Um, with a basis element, one for each element of our finite set. But I want this to be a lattice, so I have to tell you a pairing. Right, and uh, and the pairing is just extended bilinearly from telling you what the pairing of two of these guys are. These guys are called simple roots. And what is this pairing? Well, when i equals j, the pairing is two. Um, and the other possible values of the pairing are minus 1 and 0. The pairing is minus 1. And remember, each one of these guys corresponds to an element of S and hence to a generator of the vial group. And if I take two of those generators of the vial group, they either commute or they braid. So if they braid, the pairing is minus 1. If they commute, the pairing is 0. So 0 when R i, sorry, R, yeah, R i, R j equals R j, R i, and minus 1 when they braid. Okay, this is a lattice. It's a free abelian group equipped with a symmetric bilinear form. Um, and now let's let um, <coughs> so usually this is denoted by v star. This is um, this space is going to be the real vector space associated with this lattice. Um, and so, uh, the W acts linearly on the star. How?
like this. Okay, so this is the action of uh, W on V star. And, um, uh, and, and we can also introduce, let's let, will be important later, but V be the, the linear dual of, um, this is the linear dual of V, uh, then this also inherits uh, you know, a contragradient of dual action of W, just, um, just given by Depends which one you want to think of as the dual of which. So Z of. Okay. So these are the two, these spaces, um, V and V dual, and the action of W are to study. So now I need uh, need one more one more definition. So so let's define C. I mean, it's important. By the way, this will be a little bit confusing. For today, I'm not putting subscripts here, but every, all the vector spaces here are real vector spaces. When we start talking about braid groups, we're going to have to move to complex vector spaces. But for the moment, everything here is a real vector space. So define C in V by um, this is the this is called the vial chamber. And um, Just to emphasize that this is over R. So now, what you, what, if you really want to understand the action of W in this representation, what you do is see how it acts on the vial chamber. So you take the union, or all W and W, of uh, the closure of C. So this is, uh, this, this is a, an important sub, uh, subset of the vector space V called the Tietz cone. Okay, and uh, and there's also inside so inside the Tietz cone there's the regular part, which is the um, where you remove um, I'll explain this in a moment where you you remove some. Um, some hyperplanes. So here, I have to introduce some notation here. So, so we had the simple roots alpha i, and we had this action of w. So if I look at the w, the, the image of the simple roots under the action of the vial group, um, those are what are called real roots. So these. Um, And these roots 
are partitioned into two sets, the so-called the positive real roots and the negative real roots. So what, what does this partition mean? So you know, this, is a, um, this is a vector in V star. So if I act by an element of the Weyl group on this vector in V star, that's some other vector in V star, you express it as a linear combination of the basis alpha i. And it turns out that all the coefficients are either, they're either all non-negative or they're all non-positive. So the ones where the coefficients are all non-negative are the, the positive real roots, and the ones where they're all non-positive are the negative real roots. So, and associated to any alpha here, you have, you have a hyperplane H alpha. This is the z such that z of alpha is 0. So OK. So the, for the moment, the upshot is that, uh, and this is, so if you were only interested in finite vial groups and the braid groups associated to finite vial groups, then actually you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't really need to worry about this because this, this space would actually be equal to the whole space V. So when W is finite, this TR is the entire space V. But when the vial group W is not finite, uh, this, this will be a, a convex subset of V, but it won't always be the whole thing. Um, Let's look at a picture. Um, let's look at a picture. If you want to, uh, so, so here's a picture. So, here, so what, what example is this? This is the um, the affine vial group. This is. Uh, at the, a picture of the vial group action on the Tietz cone in, uh, for affine SL3. So here, in this example, this W has three generators, which I'm so all pairs braid, all distinct pairs braid. So there are no no commuting. So, so S1, S2, S1, S2, 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 etc. Now, what is this picture actually? Well, in this case. In this case, the vector space V is a three-dimensional real vector space. We have three generators here. So, The Tietz cone is not all of V, however. In this case, the Tietz cone is, uh, is a uh, half space in, um, in V. And uh, it's like, you know, it's a, the positive half of a, of a half space in V. And so what's drawn here is an affine two-dimensional real subspace in that upper half space. So that that's so that's a that's a two-dimensional real this two dimension this what looks like a two-dimensional real vector space is actually a two-dimensional hyperplane but not through the origin inside V. Um, and so the picture here is this is the intersection of this is the intersection of the Tietz cone with that two-dimensional space. So this is a nice example to think about because you can draw pictures on the blackboard. Even though the picture, even though everything is in principle happening in a, in a real three-dimensional vector space. Okay, um, and this shaded region here is the um, is the vial chamber, and 
<coughs> and now you can picture that, and now, uh, now how is the, how is the vial group acting? Well, here I've drawn the hyperplane alpha one equals zero. So the generator S1 acts just by reflection in this hyperplane. This uh, green is alpha two equals zero, so the vial group acts by reflection, and the blue is alpha three equals zero, so it's acts by reflection. Now, the, so the, the, the point here, and we'll, I'll say something more about this, is that um, there's a very close connection between the action of W on, um, on the Tietz cone and if you like the geometry of W in in the Coxeter generators. So for example, <coughs> so here's a so well before I say this theorem, so so for example it turns out that W acts, um, uh, acts freely and properly discontinuously on this vial chamber C. In other words, the upshot of that is that the, you can think of, once we fix this vial chamber, the, there's a bijection between elements of W and the chambers in this picture. So each chamber here is W of C for a unique W and W. So if you want to think about elements of W, now you have a picture, you can think about chambers in this picture. Um, and now you can add, you can study questions about like understanding how to express W as a product of generators by looking at the geometry of this picture. So, um, so, and, and you can also think about positive and negative roots in this picture. So in this, so this picture was in V. This, what we've drawn here is, is the Tietz cone inside V. The roots, remember, lived in V dual. So, so if you have a root alpha in V dual, alpha defines a, a half space in the Tietz cone, namely, um, namely the half space say alpha which is all the elements in V such that alpha of V is positive or so for example if you want to think about the simple root alpha 1 that's really this half space here all the stuff to the right um, and the alpha 2, the positive root alpha 2, is this half space, et cetera. So if you want to know if you so each of these lines here is a root, it, it is, a, is a hyperplane, and it defines a positive root, the half space that contains this chamber, and a negative root, which is the half space which doesn't contain this chamber. And now there's a theorem. Um, So, which explains the relationship between the, the kind of combinatorics of expressions for W in the generators and the geometry of this picture. Okay. So. Positive root. Uh, and let's let W and W. Then the root W acting on lambda. So this is some half space. This half space is. 
negative if and only if the length this. Okay. So, um, so what does this picture mean? So this is, okay. So let lambda be a positive root. So that's, what's that mean? Lambda is a positive root. It means lambda is a half space which contains this picture. So you've got some line in this picture, and you're looking at a half space which contains the wild chain. Okay? I want to study this element of the vial group, W. So for instance, I might want to know, um, if I multiply, so if I multiply by an element of the vial group, say a generator, I might want to know when that increases the length of W or decreases the length of W. That's a question that one that that's a question which makes no direct reference to, to this picture. You just might want to know something about what's the length of this. So here, length of W is the minimum k such that W can be written as product of k generator. So that's something you might want to know about W, which makes no reference to this. <coughs> um, and uh, and so, that, so, so for instance, I might, so this element W, this, I could look at the reflection in the hyperplane lambda. And I might want to know if I act by the reflection of the hyperplane lambda, does that increase the length or not? The group here in a question. And, to tell that, all you have to do is you have to look at the picture. You had a, you had a line here, which was a positive root. So we're, we're looking at this half space that contains C. And you act by W, that gives me some other half space. And I just look, does it contain C or not? If it does contain C, then this length does not decrease. If it does not contain C, then this length does decrease. So this gives an algorithm, so corollary. Uh, the action, the rep, the the representation of the logarithm of e is faithful. In other words, that is no kernel, and um, moreover. Uh, There's an algorithm to solve the, the word problem in W. So, okay. So, the word problem. If you have a, a group G, which is, has, some gener has some presentation, the word problem asks, is there an algorithm to tell whether or not a word in the generators is the identity in the group or not. So when you have a presentation of a group, you, have, you should think of these as, these as uh, letters, and you have words you can form in these letters. Some of them are the identity in the group, and some are not. The word problem asks, is there an algorithm to determine, um, is there an algorithm you can tell me which will work, but no matter what input word I take, I can tell whether or not they all have the identity or not. So, so the, the upshot here is that these vial groups have a solvable word problem. When the vial group is finite, this is unsurprising, um, because you could just write down the multiplication table, and that would uh, be an algorithm to solve the word problem. But, um, but in general, these, these infinite groups, they have solvable word problem. And that's a very basic, purely group theoretic question which is answered representation theoretically. 
uh, by finite dimensional linear algebra. And I bring this up because this is the simplest example of a problem which is open for braid group. So for, uh, for, the, for the braid groups associated to W, um, the word problem is open. In general, so in specific cases, like the type A braid group is um, it's known, but, but in the generality we have, um, we've presented here, certainly for braid groups associated to arbitrary cocktail group, um, this question is open. And this is an example of the sort of question which one should be able to solve um, via categorification. OK. Um, <coughs> OK. Um, so let me, um, OK, so I, now I, I know um, much of this story is probably well known to many of you already. So uh, let me, um, and maybe we'll, tomorrow we'll, in the first part of tomorrow, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit um, before we move on to braid groups. So let me give you, an, I want to give you an example of uh, another more subtle group theoretic property of vial groups that emerges from this representation in the action on the Tietz cone. Um, so, which is uh, significantly stronger than um, the word problem being solvable. So, okay, so here's, uh, so here's a stronger question than solving the word problem you might ask. So let's, so, um, so let's let, do I have six more minutes? Okay. Um, so I'll set this up and then I'll explain the, okay. Um, okay, so let's let, uh, so this is, I'll tell you a little bit about finite state automata and regular languages. This is, um, this is kind of an aside which won't, well, it's not so important necessarily for talking about stability conditions and break groups, um, but this is, I think, an, uh, an important part of the theory of cocktail groups, uh, which is not as well known as it should be. So, okay, so let's let uh, let A be an alphabet, and this means I just have a set of letters. Um, so a language. Is, uh, is just a subset of words you can make in this alphabet. Of, you know, each word is finite length, finite length words in the alphabet A. Um, okay, so Automaton based on the alphabet A is a finite directed graph well not necessarily sorry it's a directed graph I won't say finite yet so the, the vertices of this graph are um, are what are called states of the automaton. Um, uh, 
with each edge labeled by a letter in our alphabet. Um, and uh, um, Equip now the, the states, so we have a finite, I'll draw a picture in a second. So we have a, a finite, a directed graph, and each edge has a, is labeled by one of the letters in our alphabet. And I have to have, a, one of the states, one of the vertices is distinguished as what's called the initial state, designated initial state, and subset of states called um, accepting states. Okay, so let me draw a picture. This is not, it's kind of complicated to say. The idea is not complicated. So let's, uh, let's say for a, se for a second that my alphabet has um, two letters in it, S1 and S2. So I'm just going to draw an automaton based on A. So this guy here is my this is my initial state. It's one of my vertices. And um, Here's a graph. This graph happens to be finite graph. Um, it has uh, an initial state, and this I might not have written this down, but uh, it's convenient to require that from every state, there's one directed edge with each letter label coming out of it to some other state. So I have my initial state. So I have an edge labeled S1, which goes to some other state, and an edge labeled S2, which goes to some other state. From here, I've got an edge labeled S1, which goes to some state, an edge labeled S2, and et cetera. Okay. Uh, in principle, yeah, that's right. That's the, yeah, there's no, no requirement uh, of the initial state not being the target. Although I think uh, in the examples, we'll talk about that when I'm the So this, any time you have an automaton like this, this automa an automaton like this, so A, um, and automaton. Maybe I'll take four more minutes. Mm -hmm. Recognizes a language L. What language does it? So remember, and we have some. We have an alphabet. A language is a subset of words in the alphabet. If I draw a picture like this, that tells me a language. It tells me a subset of words. Which words am I meaning to? Um, uh, to say, well, I have to tell you what the accepting states are. So I'm going to tell you which states are not accepting. This is the only non-accepting state. So, so this is what's sometimes called, in this case, this is what's called a fail state. So all the other states are accepting, but this guy is not an accepting state. So what's the language that's recognized? The language that's recognized is all the paths in this graph, starting at the initial point, that end at an accepting state. In other words, that don't end at the fail state. So let's just uh, draw. The, let's just figure out what language is accepted by. Well, can you guys see Let's in this example. Let's um, let's draw the language L for this for that automaton. Let's recognize. Um, well. The initial, the initial guy was an accepting state, so the empty word is OK. Um, I, could, uh, I could do S1. That would be fine. That's, or I could do S2. That would be fine. Now, let's say I start with S1. What's the, next le what's the next edge I could go to and still end at an accepting state? Well, if you look carefully at that picture, if I, if I 
go from, if I do S1 and then S2, I end at a, uh, I don't end at the fail state. But if I do S1 and then S1, I end at the fail state. Right? So this, so S2, S1 is in here, but S1, S1 is not accepted by this automaton. Because this is a path that ends at the fail state. Um, so in this case, it's maybe not hard to check, and you can convince yourselves that these are the only words, that the language of accepting states is these, consists of these words, MP S1, S2, S2, S1, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, and S2, S1, S2. Yeah. Well, if you see in this, uh, in this example, the fail state is a uh, sync. Yes? The fact that it's two paths to the same vertex doesn't mean anything. Um, but of course, uh, of course, I mean, of course, it's a very reasonable question because we recognize these, um, uh, we recognize this language as the language of reduced words in the symmetric group S3, right? So in this case, these are exactly, note that this happens to be the set of reduced expressions in, uh, in the vial group of SL3, um, which is the symmetric group S3. So this set for any W, the reduced expressions in W is something that you, um, the possible reduced expressions for elements of W is a, is a language that one might be interested in, in, um, in the sort of algebraic combinatorics of Lyell group. And so the, the terminology is the language rec so, so if L is the language of a finite state automaton, finite state means finitely many vertices, then we say L is regular. So that's a definition. A regular language is a language recognized by a finite state automaton. Uh, if you like, maybe informally, you might think these are the, I mean, th this language was, I think, actually comes from uh, um, like linguistics literature. Um, these are the sorts of things that you could maybe study on a computer without too much difficulty. So, um, so a theorem, which I will, uh, I think I will, talk about this tomorrow because I think it's interesting and it's also relevant for, a little relevant for what we'll say for break group. Um, so here's a, here's a really, I think a very deep theorem. So this is uh, user Brink and Howlett. For any katz moody vial group, W, actually for any Coxeter group, for those of you who want to think about general cognitive groups. Um, the language of reduced expressions is, is regular. The language of reduced expressions, whatever cognitive group you're studying, the, the words in the generators which are reduced expressions, that's recognized by finite state of And so in the last, maybe, two minutes, I just want to give you um, a short example to illustrate what this means and why it's non-trivial. This will kind of hopefully address uh, Emily's question about whether or not it matters that the, the two paths end in the same state. So here's an example. Um, Um, so let's say, uh, let's say d W is the 
free product of Zmod2 is Zmod2. So I've got two generators and no relation other than the fact that their squares are one. So they, so actually I don't think I wrote this earlier, uh, although I should have, somebody should have caught me on this. Uh, the pairs of generators, the options are they braid, they commute, or you impose no relation. That's, uh, I don't think I wrote that before, but that was a pretty big omission. So here's a, um, so this is an example. So let's write down, uh, so, so now it's easy to see what the reduced expressions here are. The reduced expressions are just the alternating strings. S1, S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, or S2, S1, S2, S1, S2, S1. If you ever have two S1s in a row, it's not a reduced expression. If you ever have two S2s in a row, it's not a reduced expression. So here's an automaton which recognizes the reduced expressions. Here's your initial state. I'm just drawing the nodes to accept states. Everything else, everything else goes to the fail state. So S1 goes here. S1 and S2 stay at the fail state. S2 goes here, et cetera. S2. So this is an automaton which recognizes the reduced expression here. It's not finite state. Here the states are actually in bijection with the elements of this group. So this automaton recognizes the reduced expressions, but it's not finite state. So it is a, in this example, not particularly difficult, but it's not obvious. Even for this example, you have to think for a minute, and in general, it's very far from obvious, that there's actually a better version of this graph you could draw, which will recognize the same language as this graph, but which will only have finitely many vertices. And in this case, let's just draw what it is. And here's maybe my fail state. So this is a finite graph. It only has four vertices. But the language accepted by this finite state automaton is exactly the same as the language accepted by this finite state automaton. It's exactly the reduced expressions in this group. Yes. Yeah, if you, if you like, you can, I'm drawing it just uh, to be very explicit about things, but you're right. I mean, you could, you could remove the requirement that from every vertex there's a labeled edge with every SI, and instead just draw the kind of accept things and, yeah, it's okay. Yeah. So, so the theorem, the, the brink howlett theorem is that for every Hochschutter group, there's actually an FSA for reduced expression. Um, that is a very, very far from obvious thing. I think it's one of the deeper things here. Okay, I'll stop here. Sorry for going over. I won't do it. Uh, I mean, the, gr the groups which have a... Um, I mean, I, th I, I, uh, I think that's just a, I mean, I, there is a characterization, I think there's a characterization of, uh, of these guys involving game functions of the group, but I mean, it's more just the, I mean, not all groups have, not all presentations of groups have uh, the language of reduced expressions uh, regular. There are definitely examples which aren't. Uh, so it's more that this is just a class of groups that one might be interested in from a complexity theory point of view, and it includes all the And the proof of this will use the representation theory we talked about, this representation on the root lattice.